An infarct is an area of ischemic necrosis caused by occlusion of either the arterial supply or the venous drainage. Infarction is an extremely important clinical illness and one of the major causes of death worldwide. Common types of infarction include myocardial infarction, cerebral infarction, pulmonary infarction, bowel infarction, and ischemic necrosis of extremities. First let's discuss about the causes of infarction. Nearly all infarcts result from thrombotic or embolic arterial obstruction. Occasionally, infarctions are caused by other mechanisms, including local vasospasms, bleeding into an atheromatous plaque, or extrinsic vessel compression by a tumor for an example. Rare causes of infarction include torsion of a vessel, such as in torsion of testis and intestinal volvulus and traumatic or vascular compromise by edema, such as an anterior compartment syndrome. Although venous obstruction can cause infarction, more common outcome is congestion and edema. When there is venous obstruction, collateral channels rapidly open up and permit vascular flow. This improves the arterial flow to the affected organ or tissue. Therefore, those tissues are less likely to get infarctions. However, organs with a single afferent vein such as testis and ovaries are more likely to get infarcted in venous obstruction. Because they have a single vein, its obstruction will increase the pressure within the tissue as no collaterals present. And this will ultimately lead to impaired arterial flow, followed by ischemia and infarction. And sometimes, capillary obstruction may also cause infarction. For example, vasculitis of capillaries may narrow down the capillary lumen, causing ischemia and infarction of the affected area. In addition, disseminated intravascular coagulation, frostbites, and fat embolism may also cause infarction due to capillary obstruction. Now let's discuss about different types of infarcts. They can be categorized into many types. Predominantly, they are categorized into pale or red infarcts, according to their morphology. In addition, they are categorized into septic or bland infarcts and arterial or venous infarcts. Paler anemic infarcts occur with arterial occlusions in solid organs such as kidneys, heart, and spleen, which have end arterial supply. This image shows a pale infarction in the spleen. Yellow arrow indicates the infarct. As soon as the occlusion occurs, blood seeps into the affected area. And venous backflow also occurs. So, the infarct is initially red in color. With time, extravasated red cells undergo enzymatic digestion. So, the infarct becomes pale. Ultimately, infarcted area becomes fibrosed. Sometimes, calcification may also occur. And, secondary infection of these infarcts lead to abscess formation. Redder hemorrhagic infarctions occur in following settings. With venous occlusions, such as an ovarian vein obstruction. In loose tissues, such as in lungs, where blood can collect in the infarcted zone. In tissues with dual circulations, such as lung and small intestines in tissues previously congested by sluggish venous outflow. And, when flow is re-established to a site of previous arterial occlusion and necrosis, for an example, following angioplasty of an arterial obstruction. This image shows a hemorrhagic infarction of the lung. Appreciate the dark red color in the periphery, in contrast to the previous image of pale infarction. With time, extravasated red cells in hemorrhagic infarctions are phagocytosed by macrophages, and they convert heme into hemosiderin. With extensive hemorrhage, this hemosiderin gives a brownish appearance to the infarct. Most of the time, infarcts tend to be wedge-shaped, with the occluded vessel at the apex and periphery of the organ forming the base. In these two images, yellow arrows indicate the apex and red arrows indicate the base of the infarct. If the base is a serosal surface, there can be a fibrinous exudate on the surface. Acute infarctions are poorly defined and slightly hemorrhagic due to the seepage of blood. With time, the margins are better defined by a narrow rim of congestion due to inflammation. In the brain, the process is somewhat different. Infarcted area undergoes rapid liquefactive necrosis and becomes a fluid-filled cyst surrounded by gliasis. In this picture, yellow circle indicates a brain infarction. In the intestines, wet gangrene develops in the infarct as a result of secondary infection by intestinal flora. Septic infarcts occur when infected cardiac valve vegetation embolize or when microbes seed on necrotic tissue. In these instances, the infarct is converted into an abscess. Ultimately, this abscess becomes fibrosed as a result of the healing process. Now let's discuss about the factors that influence development of an infarct. Most important determinant of the development of an infarct is the nature of the vascular supply. 
this means availability of an alternative blood supply, or in simple words, presence of collateral circulation. For example, lung has a dual blood supply from pulmonary and bronchial arteries, which provides protection from thromboembolism-induced infarction. Similarly, liver has a dual hepatic artery and portal vein circulation. And the hand and forearm, with their dual radial and ulnar arterial supply, are usually resistant to infarction. In contrast, renal and splenic circulations are end-arterial. And vascular obstruction generally causes infarction. Second most important determinant is rate of occlusion development. Slowly developing occlusions are less likely to cause infarction because they provide enough time to develop alternative perfusion pathways. For example, the three major coronary arteries are interconnected by small interarteriolar anastomoses with minimal function in normal conditions. If one major coronary artery is slowly occluding, flow within the collaterals increases and it may be sufficient to prevent infarction. Another one is vulnerability to hypoxia. Not all the cells are equally sensitive to hypoxia. For example, neurons can live without oxygen for only about 4 minutes. But if we take myocardial cells, they can live for about 20 to 30 minutes without oxygen. And if we take fibroblasts, they can live for even hours without oxygen. Final one is the oxygen content of blood. If we take an otherwise normal person with partial obstruction of a vessel due to some reason and an anemic patient with the same degree of occlusion, the anemic patient is more likely to get an infarction over the normal person. Finally, I would like to discuss two important MCQs with you. Pause the video and try to answer them first. Now, gangrene occurs due to secondary infection of an infarcted area with anaerobic bacteria. Infarctions in lower limbs in diabetic patients most often complicate by wet gangrene, with anaerobes coming from the soil. Infarctions in the small intestine can also be complicated by gangrene with anaerobes in the intestinal flora. But another three types of infarction mentioned here do not undergo wet gangrene because anaerobes cannot reach those areas. So, the answers should be A and B. In the second question, all are effects of infarction except pulmonary embolism. Fever and raised DSR are general effects of inflammation in the infarcted area. Formation of aneurysms typically occurs with myocardial infarctions because infarction causes weakening of the heart walls. Elevated ALT and AST levels is also a consequence of myocardial infarction and liver infarction. Pulmonary embolism is not an effect of infarction. Pulmonary embolism is a cause for pulmonary infarction. So, the answer should be E. Okay. That's all I wish to discuss in this video. Thanks for watching.